So I'm here today to tell you the story of my grandmother. That's her uh, on the upper left-hand side of the photo. This photo was taken probably around 1942, so she would have been 11 or 12 years old at the time. That's her with her siblings and her mother, uh, who, who actually passed away soon afterwards. So growing up, my grandmother used to tell me the same five or six stories about her childhood. These were usually happy stories, but there was one in particular that wasn't. I remember hearing bits of this story when I was 10, 12, 15 years old, usually sitting with my grandparents in their London home after dinner. The story was never fully coherent, except for one image that has remained seared in my mind since then. That's the image of my grandmother as a teenager, standing alone in the middle of her room, terrified, packing her bag hurriedly. Her father had rounded her and her siblings up and told them to pack up only what they needed for a short time, that they were in danger and needed to leave immediately, but would surely be back home soon. Foreign forces had invaded their hometown and begun bombing areas near them. Families began pouring out of their homes in terror, some of them taking their chances and heading straight into the sea, others beginning what would be a long and arduous journey on foot. Luckily, my grandmother and her family made it out safely that day and were among the fortunate few to be able to board a plane onto safer ground. So this is probably one of the final photos taken of my grandmother before um, she left her home. So this year, the year that I turned 30, I decided to go to the place where my grandmother had grown up. After arriving and having some random conversations with people I'd never met before and telling them that I was looking for her house, I was soon armed with a couple of leads to start my search. I arrived in her hometown and straight away called a local tour guide who pointed me in the direction of her neighborhood. Within minutes, I found myself standing on the same street that she had stood on nearly 70 years before, smelling the same sea breeze and touching the same old stone. I felt myself melt completely into the atmosphere, knowing that a part of me somehow had always been there. I called my grandmother as I stood on her street. This is what the street looks like now. As I was standing in the spot, I spoke to her, hoping that maybe with her on the other side of the line, I might be able to somehow find her house. She kept saying to me on the phone, King George Avenue, tomorrow. That's where the house was. So I went looking up and down the street, searching for any house that might fit her description. Three levels with a trading floor at the bottom, on a street corner with balconies. I didn't find the house that day, or the next day that I went back. But somehow, it didn't really matter because I already knew that I'd found some kind of silent treasure in Yaffa. This is what Yaffa, her hometown, looks like now. In Arabic, people call it uh, the bride of the sea, Harus al Bahar. So, um, 1940, no, 1948, in fact. 1948 was the year that my grandmother was forced to leave Palestine and to leave her home. This is her with her sister, Malak, and her brother, Naim, with Palestine in the background. So her story, although special in its detail, is not actually a unique one. That year, around 800,000 Palestinians were forced to leave their homes or fled in terror. That's around 80% of the Arab population of Palestine at the time. Around 531 villages were destroyed or resettled by Zionist armed forces in the 1948 war, in the lead up to the establishment of the State of Israel. So, why does this story matter for us today? Not because it's the story of my grandmother. I think it matters for us because the story is representative of different moments in history, 
moments that mark the upheaval and struggle experienced by so many different people in so many different parts of the world. It matters because this is a similar story, although a different moment in, in history, experienced by Jewish refugees fleeing from oppression in the 1930s and 1940s. It matters because as a result of that particular moment in 1948, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians continue to struggle today as the children and the grandchildren and even the great-grandchildren of those families displaced in 1948 continue to live in temporary refugee camps scattered across the Arab world, still waiting to return home. Some of them still own their keys and their deeds to their old houses. It matters because as we speak and next door to Israel-Palestine in Syria, a new generation of landless and homeless people is being created, some of whom will be absorbed into the fabric of this very country in the coming years. All of these people that I'm mentioning, and there are many, many more of them around the world, including uh, my grandmother's story, all of those people um, continue to wait to return home for so many years. I'm not sure when my grandmother might have given up on the idea that she might be able to go home, but I know that it's something that has stayed with her all this time, and that's why she was able to transmit such a strong feeling to me. And I imagine that's the same for many refugees who somehow imagine and, and believe and hope, as they should, that they will return home soon. So I think it also matters because through this story, you can engage with an experience that might otherwise be completely alien to you. And I really believe in the power of stories to open hearts and minds. I think that's what's needed today more than ever. Um, a reminder of our shared humanity. I think that if we can start to see these struggles of oppression, not as political struggles, but as human struggles for the most basic rights, then maybe we can begin to change the way that we perceive them. The word makan means place in Arabic. Makan is the name of the project I'm now working on that hopes to do just this to cut through the political in order to reach the most human core of the Palestinian struggle. To try and remind people that ultimately what Palestinians are trying, are hoping for on a day-to-day -day basis and working towards is quite simply a dignified life and a place where they can raise their children in safety. I'm working on McCann with a fellow Palestinian colleague, Tariq. Him and I are both the fruits of this story that I've shared with you today. The offspring of ancestors who found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. We've both, in our different ways, searched for our place in this greater story. So before I continue, I want to tell you how the search for my grandmother's house actually panned out. Because I had pretty much given up on you know, the, the hope of actually finding her house when I was there in Yaffa on my last day or two. But on that last day, I had what seemed at the time like a random encounter with two local older men who knew Yaffa inside out and who had actually heard of my grandmother's family. One of them, Abu George, a Palestinian who's been in Yaffa since the 1950s, and the other, Yossi, an Israeli. I had the fortune of meeting them and they willingly became my guides for the next hour, practically holding my hand as we embarked upon the adventure of looking for my grandmother's house. This is a selfie that I took with them <laughs> uh, just before I left Yaffa, actually. That's Yossi on the left-hand side and Abu George in the middle. I think you can tell from their faces how lovely they are. Um, so soon after I took that photo, just before I left Yaffa, I pressed a piece of paper with my details on it into Yossi's hand, Yossi who had voluntarily offered to continue the search for my grandmother's house. And he in turn gave me a piece of Yaffa stone to give to my grandmother. I left and within a few days I was back on stable ground at home in London. 
the sharpness of the experiences I'd accumulated on my trip began to blur at the edges, and Palestine once again began to regain that mythical quality that it has always had for me. And then I received an email from Yossi, which I'm actually going to try and read out to you. So the email was titled, well, with a few typos, but it was titled Your Grandfather's House. He meant your great-grandfather, the father of, of my grandmother. So in it, he writes, Hi, Tamara, how are you? I don't know if you got my email, so I'll send it again. I found your grandfather's house. The building exists and was even studied by students of architecture at Tel Aviv University. I'm attaching here the connection to the work of the students and hope that your grandmother shall recognize the house. It is a very impressive building. Your grandfather built it as the first house in North and Nuzha. Let's hope that someday you will be able to live in it. Salmi ala sittik, which means say hello to your grandmother. Yours, Yossi. This is a photo of the house from the project, the architecture project that Yossi was talking about. This is what it looks like today. Um, when I saw this photo, I realized I had actually passed this house and even taken a photo of it when I was in Yaffa. Uh, I just had no idea, I, have, I had no way of knowing that this was the house. Um, so when I received that email from Yossi, I burst into tears. Maybe because I was crying on behalf of my grandmother and, and all that she had lost. Or maybe because through Yossi, I had unearthed this family treasure and somehow what was always an almost legendary family story had come true. I want to leave you with one final thought. The reason why I'm standing here today, apart from because of Stuart, is because of my very dear Israeli friend, Noam. And my friendship with Noam has tested me. It has tested my willingness and my ability to maintain an open heart and an open mind. She's the first close Israeli friend that I have had. Um, and it has really taught me to not allow the identities and labels of Israeli, Palestinian, Arab, Jewish, whatever, to actually dictate the human connection that you develop with a person. It's really served to remind me that, that actually all that ultimately matters is that connection that you can develop with the people or, or the person around you. Similarly, um, in this talk today, I chose not to immediately tell you where my grandmother had grown up, although you probably figured it out from Stuart's talk before. <laughs> um, I didn't initially want to tell you that she was Palestinian or grew up in Palestine, precisely because I wanted to avoid any potential preconceived notions or judgments that you might have had when hearing that word. I wanted you to care about her story, not because of where she was from, but purely because of the fact that she's human and because of the particular injustice that she suffered and that so many people have suffered and indeed today continue to suffer. And I really believe that if we can do that, if we can begin to break down and break through our prejudices that we all have and allow those identities and labels that we place on people to slowly melt away, then maybe we can remind ourselves that every person deserves a place on this earth, a place where they can raise their children in safety, a place where they melt into the atmosphere knowing that they belong, knowing that they're free, then maybe we can start to value each life equally. Thank you.